Hi folks, Joseph Kursky here with you to talk about a relevant and timely, but sadly grim topic, and that is the bushfires in Australia. Let me explain how you can map and analyze these fires right now inside ArcGIS Online. Why would you want to do that? If you're an instructor, this is a relevant topic for our for our times, right? In geography, environmental science, in GIS courses, and beyond. Also, it helps students build skills in using data and geographic information systems. More importantly, it gets them thinking about, we've got some serious issues on our planet. We've got to get a handle on these serious issues, and GIS, remote sensing, geotechnologies, are a key way to help us understand and solve problems on our planet. So let's do that. I'm going to use some procedures written by my very fine and one of my favorite colleagues, Bern Sokolsky. Let's get started. We're going to start with ArcGIS Online, cloud-based software as a solution. I'm going to sign in so I can access data from the Living Atlas of the world. You're going to sign in with your own organizational account. If you don't have an account, you can go to developers.arcgis.com and get your own free account. So you can get an account through your university, through your school, through your organization, uh, government agency, private industry, nonprofit organization. If you don't have one, though, go to the developer site that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to go to Map. I'm going to make a map, and I have an Add button. Because I'm signed in, I have this Add button. I also have some analysis tools. So I'm going to, when I say Add, I'm going to browse the Living Atlas layers. The Living Atlas is a curated, authoritative set of data. I've got some other videos on it. A colleague and I have just created the first in a series of courses to help you use the Living Atlas of the World, which is out on the training.esri.com site. I highly encourage you to take advantage of the Living Atlas. It's one of the best resources, in my view, that has ever been created in the world of geospatial technology and mapping. So we're going to go add data. We're going to search the Living Atlas for MODIS, M-O-D-I-S. The MODIS data is the Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectroradiometer, MODIS, M-O-D-I-S. It's an instrument operating on both the Terra and the Aqua spacecraft. It has a viewing swath width of 2,300-ish kilometers and views the entire surface of the Earth every one to two days. Its detectors measure 36 spectral bands between 0.4 and 14 micrometers. It acquires data at three spatial resolutions. 250 meters, 500 meters, and 1,000 meters. You can do some more research on the MODIS spectroradiometer. But a great source of data for this topic because we're talking about heat for one thing. So we're going to be able to look at this MODIS data. We're going to look at thermal hotspots and fire activity from the S3 live feeds. You can read more about it in the metadata right here. We're going to go ahead and add to map. In order to do that, we're going to get rid of this metadata page. Here are some areas in the US, but of course we're interested right now in Australia. So let's go ahead and pan over there. And sadly, we've got lots of points that we can examine in here. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I'm recording this video on 21 January 2020, and somewhere within yesterday, one kilometer of this location has been identified as hot by satellite sensors. So you can see, and this is today actually right here, so these are the thermal activities, hot spots identified by the MODIS satellite. Okay, and if we zoom in, we can see different points here. You can also, since it's in ArcGIS Online, you could search for layers and look at, for example, ecoregions. So if we do that and look at uh, ecoregions in ArcGIS Online, we want ecoregions of the world. Make that a bit transparent. Pop up that legend there. And then we can see what the different ecoregions are and which ones right now ha are experiencing the most in terms of hot spots. Okay, so you've got this Eastern Australia, Australian temperate forests, and then over here you've got the savanna region and the shrublands. So you can look at other things as well using the same technique of adding data. You can look at population density, you can look at river systems, uh, etc. Access. Uh, of, of highways to these to these hotspots. How are they going to fight the fires? Airports, etc. Current wind and weather patterns. There's a lot you can actually do just with the add button inside ArcGIS Online. 
And remember, you've got data here. So you've got the thermal activity, but notice these right arrows, depending on the layers that you've got in your map, you've got, in my case, the average evapotranspiration at that spot. And then you've got a sense of population density. And of course, you've got the image metadata there as well. Now, and as I explain in other videos and in several blog, blog posts that I've written in the past, Sentinel-2. When Sentinel-2 came out, it was, to, to me, a great advancement in the world of geospatial technology, remote sensing, and GIS. Because the Sentinel-2 is a multispectral, multi-temporal global imagery obtained via two satellites placed in the same orbit by the European Space Agency. And they're phased 180 degrees from each other. Every location on the planet is revisited every five days. Now, the Living Atlas imagery layer pulls content directly from the Sentinel-2 archive on Amazon Web Services. Now, what does that mean for you and I? It means that we've got this data at our fingertips, which is incredible, and it's updated daily. This layer can be easily added, as you will see in a moment, to web maps and scenes, 3D scenes. Remember, you can do 3D scenes as well in ArcGIS Online, and rendered in different ways to highlight specific characteristics. In addition, the imagery can be filtered by date. Ooh, okay. So what, how are we going to use that? We're going to go and look at adding the Sentinel-2 imagery layer from the Living Atlas. So just like we did before, before we do that, I'm going to turn off a couple of these things. I'm going to turn off the eco regions and go ahead and add Living Atlas layer, and I'm going to go ahead and do Sentinel-2 Sentinel-2 there. Sentinel-2 views. Okay, so let's go ahead and add that. And the default layer will display the most recent and clearest imagery available. So even right here, you can see, as you zoom in, you can see what's going on in specific areas, for example, in Australia or anywhere on the, on the planet. You can see uh, the settlement pattern, rivers, mountains, etc. What we want to do next, though, is we want to search for all imagery around the dates of the fire, even smoke-filled imagery. So we want to remove the filter so that all imagery will be available. So let's go ahead and go to the filter here and notice how the date is in there. So what we want to do is remove the filter. Okay, so that's step one. What we want to do is say more options and then image filter right here, image filter. Then we can adjust the time slider to see the available dates lift, listed, or we can hover over each to display the coverage footprint at specific times. We can see what's available when. Interesting. See that? Yep. So let's say we want to look at the acquisition date, and we want to look at something really recent. Okay, so we're going to adjust it to close to the current date. Acquisition date is after 19 January. Okay, I'm going to apply filter. So I've adjusted my time slider here. So I'm looking at, mm, let's look at 116 to 118 2020. So 16 to 18 Jan 2020. Let's say done there. Once I do that, you can see that I've actually got just the the three days, 16, 17, 18, January 2020, in here right now. As we zoom into those hot spots from the layer that we were looking at earlier from MODIS, and now we've got the Sentinel-2 satellite imagery on top of that. Let me show you one additional thing that you can do at this point that's really powerful. From the image options, we're going to choose image display, image display right here. And from the list of renderers, we're going to choose shortwave infrared with DRA, dynamic range adjustment. Shortwave infrared with DRA, dynamic range adjustment, as I mentioned. Okay, that's going to let us see certain bands. Shortwave infrared 2, shortwave infrared 1, and then the red 12.11.4 with dynamic range. That's going to let us see hot spots in the, from the imagery. And we're going to take the symbology as it is defaulted. We can adjust these later if we need to, to see it more clearly. Okay, so now I've got it applied, and I'm going to close that now. So now I'm looking at the Sentinel-2 views with the short wave 
infrared. So now let's go ahead and zoom in on a couple of these spots. You can see that, sadly, some of these are, are in Melbourne. Now that, that might be a city fire, um, but let's go ahead out here to the, uh, to the rural terrain and take a look. Now you can start seeing some, some smoke uh, on these images. As you zoom in, now scale matters in all things geography. So you will see things at certain scales that you won't see at other scales. Remember this this Sentinel-2 view is looking at medium resolution data. Okay, so you're not going to see houses, cars. It's higher resolution than Landsat imagery, but it's lower resolution than commercial satellites that you are used to looking at probably in day-to-day -day work to find the nearest coffee shop or the nearest library. Now I'm going to go ahead and change the symbology. Notice this small red symbol. I'm going to change that because it's difficult for me to detect those symbols on top of the satellite image. So all I have to do is change style. I'm going to show location only still, but instead of that small red symbol, I'm just going to bump up that symbol in size, and then I might also change the color of it. I'm going to make it a oversized 28-point symbol, and I'm going to make it yellow. All right, let's try that. Okay, now that gives me a little bit of a better visualization for what's going on here uh, behind the scenes. So now if we zoom in to certain locations here, we're going to be able to see things in a bit different of a way than we could earlier. And then you can also do some of the standard things that you can do with ArcGIS Online here. You can say, for example, I want to change that to the OpenStreetMap base, and that way I can see that there's this community right here with these hotspots identified, and I can do, oh, okay, I want to get the distance, right, maybe in kilometers from there to there. Okay, it's 61 kilometers, etc. You can measure perimeters, distances, and so on in the, inside the same tool, ArcGIS Online. You can also use the filtering options to just create a layer out of one of the tiles. For example, I've got Jan 2, 2 Jan 2020, and I'm looking at this right now with these hotspots right here, and I can see a lot of activity in this region alone, which is... I'll zoom out. I only have this one, but that might be good for low bandwidth situations. You're only that, or if you want to have the students just look at one image, because now I can, I've only got this, and as you can see, I am now about 400 kilometers from Brisbane. So powerful to be able to do this. I encourage you to do this with your students, with your fellow research colleagues, and with people that don't quite get why geospatial technology actually matters to our planet. This is, I think, a very compelling way to show them that, yes, this actually matters, and these technologies are being used to help people save their property and save lives. Thanks.